All right, we're on our way to the main event today. We are so excited. Everyone who works on Open Notes, we all happen to love palliative care. And we've been so excited, like what's gonna happen when Open Notes rolls up in palliative care? Who's gonna be looking at this first? We haven't done specific research on Open Notes and palliative care. So those who are doing this as early adopters are really fascinating to us. And this brings us to our presenter today. Dr. Christian Sinclair is an associate professor of palliative medicine at the University of Kansas Health System. His contributions, contributions to the field of hospice and palliative care have focused on using social media as a public health tool through his work as editor-in-chief of the website PallyMed, which I've been following for a long time, and as associate social media editor for the Journal of Pain and Management. In 2016, Dr. Sinclair served as president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Like I said, here at Open Notes, we've been following the work of Dr. Sinclair as he is one of the first early adopters of Open Notes in palliative care. And we are super excited to hear from him today. So take it away, Dr. Sinclair. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Liz. That was a great introduction. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. DeRoche for your uh, wonderful overview of uh, of open notes and where we've come in, in such a short time, but we have come quite far. Uh, I'm really excited to see a great turnout from palliative care uh, clinicians and people who are interested in open notes, because I really think there is a lot of synergy between palliative care and the, the whole idea behind open notes. So this is coming at people pretty fast though. Um, some of you may have heard about it a long time. Uh, some have just heard about it just in the past week. Um, but I want to give you uh, tips and tricks to help you feel confident in how you approach your notes, um, in, especially in the next several weeks as this rolls out at, at institutions. Uh, so, some institutions have already been doing this, but everyone's going to be seeing this November 2nd. Um, so let's get to the tips. We have a lot to cover in uh, a short amount of time because we do want to leave lots of time for questions and answers and discussion. Um, and for those of you who may have come on late, this is going to be recorded and this will be available on the Open Notes website so you can go back and look at slides in more detail if I'm a little bit quick on the trigger and you didn't happen to get a screen cap or anything. So my uh, agenda, my overview today is to talk about shared notes in general. And I use the term shared notes because it's Open Notes, but Open Notes, I want to make sure everyone here knows Open Notes is the organization. Um, and your your own healthcare organization may call it open notes internally, or they may say shared notes, or use a different term. So, um, so let's so we're going to talk about how to do shared notes in general, how to do it well, some the benefits, um, what patients think, some concerns, some tips and tricks, and then we're going to talk about some specific palliative care areas. And I've uh, been sharing notes for over a year now, uh, and I've learned a lot. I've uh, uh, both through uh, great successes and just a couple of uh, missteps and I want to share what I've learned from that and what I've learned from reading the research, what I've learned from doing lots of sessions, Q&A sessions with people at the University of Kansas, uh, people online. Um, so I'm going to share some tips that are more related to palliative care topics that, that this audience would care about. So some background in palliative care. I think a lot of people on here are palliative care clinicians or palliative care and hospice advocates, but I want to just highlight something uh, from the Nor uh, National Consensus Project on the Clinical Practice Guidelines for Quality Palliative Care. In the fourth edition that was uh, just recently released, it highlights communication as a theme that goes across all of the ways that we provide quality care. And this statement, I just want to highlight that communication is a prerequisite for delivery of quality care for the seriously ill and is emphasized throughout the National Consensus Project. And it does say communication with patients and families. Palliative care and hospice people know uh, from our training, from our work experience, that how we communicate with families is something we talk about a lot. We learn about, we go to conferences for it, we read articles about it, we research it, but a lot of it is focused on how do we verbally communicate and non-verbally in the room and a family meeting but we have to realize that our written word is another communication tool, and we have to figure out how do we use this tool uh, for the best benefit for our patients and families while still preserving our sanity and our, uh, our uh, uh, professional uh, workload. 
So Dr. DeRoche did a very fantastic job talking about some of the research, but I want to come back to it again because I just want to reinforce this. There are lots of benefits for open notes. And as we think about this, think about how, you know, I could say at the top, benefits of palliative care, improved communication, patient engagement, improved outcomes, improved safety, optimized care, fulfilled patients. Like the title could probably be switched between benefits of open notes and benefits of palliative care. So open notes and palliative care, very aligned. Uh, from other research, the majority of patients report that they want continued access, that when they use it, it helps with adherence, they feel more in control, better prepared, they have a better understanding of their own health care, and they take better care of themselves. So these are just a couple of quotes from this great uh, study. I, I love qualitative research for the quotes it gives because I think it tells us the story better sometimes than the charts. Um, but look at this, trust, confidence, collaboration, understanding, engagement. Again, this is all from open notes, but these themes are things we love to see in palliative care. Um, so some, <coughs> some of the quotes here. Reading the notes made it easier for me to understand what the doctor has said and what I need to do. It gave me insight into the evaluation process my doctor used and gave me confidence in his abilities. Uh, I'm more relaxed during the appointment and that I don't have to remember every detail. So lots of great things from, from sharing our notes with our patients that can happen. So I know I've said all these benefits and you're like, you know, shut up and take my money. Like I wanna have this right now. Why haven't we been doing this before? But I also know there's some of you who are a little bit more skeptical and maybe not the early adopter that I am. And you may be thinking, well, that all sounds great, but there's gotta be some trade-offs. There's some things that I'm really worried about. Well, let's take a look at those. What are the concerns that um, people have? Well, patient factors. Um, we're gonna spend time spent responding to these patients. They're gonna say, oh, you gotta correct this, you gotta correct that, or that's not what I said, or you didn't tell me about that. And so we're just gonna have tons of new email or EHR mail that is going to slow down our workflow and uh, decrease our potential satisfaction. That's a potential concern. Uh, maybe patients will get upset, anxious, sad, or angry, um, and that will be uh, hard for us to deal with as clinicians. Maybe we're gonna confuse patients and potentially cause harm, or maybe there's increased malpractice liability that they're gonna see something in the chart that makes them think, ah, now I need to uh, consider a lawsuit. Well, um, the experience and the research shows that these issues, while there are concerns, on the whole, they are not uh, a widespread issue that comes with open notes. Now, I'm not gonna say that no one will ever ask you to correct, that no one will never, no one will ever get upset or anxious. I've had people from my open notes that have gotten upset with me and what I wrote in there, but I changed my practice. I talk to them, I learn from them. I am a better documenting clinician now because of that, and I wanna share some of that with you. So by the ones on, on the cases, yes, sometimes these things will happen. But on the whole, these things are not the large concerns that we're seeing. Um, and I know from past, uh, from hearing from Dr. DeRoche before, that some healthcare institutions uh, malpractice their, their insurers basically say, we want you to do this because we think the communication will decrease malpractice liability. So those are the patient factors and concerns. What about the documentation factors? Well, oh, you're asking me to do something different with the notes, which already are not something I love during, at the end of the day, during pajama time, more time documenting, less accurate notes. Is this gonna change my billing because I'm gonna write stuff and then the billers and coders are gonna say, well, you didn't say severe malnutrition. You said, well, I said the patient is not eating well because I tried to make it more friendly. Uh, all of these things and the sensitive topics they, they're, they're non-issues, but I think with more information and a little bit of curiosity and some small changes in practice, we can tackle these. These are not uh, insurmountable issues that should uh, paralyze us from going forward with open notes with open arms. So let's talk about some general shared notes uh, tips and um, going to highlight some different areas. There's pre-visit, during visit, documenting, and follow through. If you don't take anything away from this except for one thing, all I want you to do, like if you have to go, I mean, you got call after this, please go read the Open Notes website. Dr. DeRoche, uh, Liz Salmi, and the team there have done a great job at putting a lot of resources there uh, for you to look up. Um, so you'll see a lot that I'll say, look at the tip sheet on Open Notes, look at the tip sheet on Open Notes. So if you take anything away or you need to share something quick with your colleagues who couldn't make it today, tell them to go read the Open Notes website. It's fantastic. So entry level, uh, I'm gonna talk about entry level and pro level tips. Um, and entry level is like, we've gotta be able to do this pretty much from next week. 
um, but I think it's very easy to accomplish for most palliative care people. First thing is expect that patients are going to read them, download them, share them. You're going to encounter situations like that. And honestly, we probably should have been written our notes, writing our notes prior to open notes. We should have been writing our notes like that anyway. Um, a very basic thing that we need to start doing is working on our in-visit communication. Explain to patients what they can expect to see. Just to even introduce the topic. Many of our healthcare organizations have been slow to talk to clinicians about open notes, but guess what? They've probably really, if they've talked to clinicians, they may not have even talked to patients and families. So they may be just getting alerts in their phone, like, oh, I can see a doctor's note. I've never seen that before. So you and your visits, you may want to say, after I write my note, you're going to be able to see it. That would be a great thing to inform them. And they're going to think, wow, you're a wonderful physician or, or a nurse practitioner or a social worker who just helped me understand that I have more access to information. So uh, kudos to you. Um, when you write your notes, be clear and succinct. Again, should be a good, strong general principle for any documentation. Um, but particularly for patients, we want to watch out for too much jargon. And if there's acronyms, um, we want to think about spelling those out. And you think, oh, great, BID is so easy to write all the time. You can set up smart phrases and other shortcuts in many health, health record systems that will allow you to type some of those things out easily. But I think it's important for us to also look at, at acronyms that might be confusing or uh, misunderstood, like shortness of breath. may mean something very different to the general public than it does to a clinician. Uh, and other acronyms that may have different meanings as they go to see different specialists. Uh, so thinking about if there are times where you're going to use an acronym, maybe spell it out once, like you might do in a research paper at the top and say what the acronym is, and then just leave it there. Um, then you can maybe use the acronym more through the through the note. Um, your note should be direct and respectful. So avoid speculation about intent or motives. Um, really kind of stick to the facts and be, be direct. And your language should be more neutral and factual and make sure that it's more person first language. So it's very common to see in notes morbid obesity, but you can talk about class three obesity as that's actually more technical and factual and a little less uh, pejorative or you can talk about direct facts like body mass index of 42. Uh, instead of diabetic, a person with diabetes, and again, uh, most of us probably think and talk and document like that in palliative care, uh, but maybe not. Um, and if that's new to you, or maybe you've been doing it before, but you didn't know it had a name, it's, basically, it's called person first language. Um, and so uh, describing the person as they have a condition as opposed to that is who the person is. Um, it says patient denies, say Tanya did not report, instead of saying poor historian, Sam could not recall. Um, I'm a big fan of actually writing the person's name multiple times in the chart instead of using the generic term patient, because then I actually get to personalize and feel like I'm more connected to the information I'm sharing, and it's connected in my mind to that, to that patient. More entry-level ideas, use supportive language. This is a great opportunity. Your notes are now communication tools. They're therapeutic interventions, potentially. Your notes can help people see their strengths. So when people are sharing how they're coping with something and you feel that's a very constructive way, make sure you highlight that in your notes um, and reinforce that. So maybe when they're reading it later, they realize, oh, my doctor sees my strengths and he doesn't just see me as a collection of illnesses. Uh, with open notes and, and really trying to be more accurate, we want to think about how we use quotes, and I think quotes are very helpful, um, but I think it's important to use quotes maybe more for short, memorable phrases that really um, pivot the conversation or give character to the conversation. If you, you, I've seen oftentimes in palliative care notes and other notes where there's these very long quotes, and very long quotes are hard to remember unless you're actually recording and you know transcribing it. So when you write a long quote, there's probably more room for error. So instead, use the sort of short memorable phrases that really emphasize and use your own language to paraphrase the other ideas. Um, I think that would probably be a safer way to, to use quotes. Um, realize that ICD-10 codes may be in part of your billing, your after visit summary, your actual note. Um, and they may have things like morbid obesity in the ICD-10, but doesn't match your language, but just recognize that your patients may be seeing that. And lastly, don't oversimplify your notes. Don't just go to one other extreme and change your practice completely and make things so 
basic and and lay focused that you're avoiding good clinical communication and don't avoid sensitive issues. We need to figure out a way to communicate these with respect in ways that help advance the patient's care um, and still uh, uh, reflect the situation. So let's get to the pro level. Those are the things you should hopefully be able to do as a team uh, pretty quickly because you probably already do most of them. So probably not too much change. These are the pro level. These are the things that I think you can really start to, to get better at it and become more of an expert, maybe help your teammates, help other uh, specialties and other disciplines that you work with that are outside of palliative care get better and you can, you can feel more confident in your knowledge. So definitely go read open notes have a meeting with your group. I know there's not much time, but guess what? Even after this starts, you can have a meeting in a couple of weeks with your group to say, let's sit down and talk about this. Um, take a look at the note templates that you have in your EHR. Are they, are, are they already patient-centered or are there things you can do that make them more patient-centered? Our group at the University of Kansas looked at our the way we uh, make our, our um, stub about prognosis this, and how we think about how we document prognosis and we uh, we readjusted that. What common phrases might need to be altered that your team uses a lot and kind of brainstorm and come together and, and say, ah, instead of this, we should say this. If you are a specialty and palliative care doesn't have a lot of acronyms, but maybe for your other colleagues in different specialties, if we have a lot of acronyms, make an easy acronym list and hand those out to your patients at clinic visits or in the hospital to say, hey, these are acronyms you might see in my note and I just want you to know what they are and have an easy reference guide. Um, at the pro level, you got to know what your organization is doing. Yes, in the United States, this is a national uh, mandate, but your organization may be doing things very differently. Uh, lastly, you can volunteer on your open notes team, and you might need to know how many patients are actually using uh, your EHR portal and potentially going to look, look at your notes. During the visit, um, talk about shared notes. I talked about that as entry level, but really open up that conversation. I found that's been a great way to connect with patients and for them to be more likely to go look at the notes, but also give me feedback um, because I've asked for it. Um, some people actually document and dictate uh, or dictate with the patient in the room. That's not merely my style, but some people can do that really easily. Um, and then also uh, just another pro level, um, there's a our notes initiative, which talks about patient generated notes uh, to add into the electronic health record. So, um, so that's more. So I'm gonna speed through these a little bit faster because I do wanna get to the palliative care stuff. Um, so there may be stuff on here that I don't verbally hit on, but you can read and go back to later. Um, there are citations at the, at the bottom for some things that are cited, but a lot of this is through general experience um, and hearing from different people. It's not published yet. Um, so uh, again, once you're, so you've gone through the visit, you're documenting now, use your EHR smart phrases to easily spell out acronyms or correct non-patient center phrases. So you can do something like an EPIC that if anytime you type diabetic, just because you're just typing really fast and you type diabetic, it actually changes to a person with diabetes, um, uh, which can help you or may, may be confusing if you said diabetic medications. So um, think about those smart phrases, make the computer work for you. Um, if you talk about future plans, it's really important in your plan to say that you may consider this in the future, because if your language says, um, you know, uh, 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 consider starting methadone, you need to check EKG, um, that, and that's something you haven't necessarily discussed, but you're talking to your future self, how you phrase that may really uh, uh, be, mis be understood in different ways by patients. Um, so if you use notes as a way to talk to your future self to give you ideas of things you need to check on or follow up on, make sure it's clear what is really more something you consider or an instruction you're giving the patient. Um, I, <laughs> I like to include a shared note statement, which is this, which is after my signature, it comes in automatically, I don't type this out, and it just highlights this is a shared note, I support patients' rights to see their, uh, their health information and we're partners, and if they have concerns, this is the funnel that I'd like them to uh, address those concerns with us um, because I don't want them reading something on a Saturday morning, getting extremely anxious and feeling like they don't have a way to address this until Monday. So you've already documented, what do you do after this at the pro level? Well, once this starts happening, talk with your patients. Did you read the note? Did you read other people's notes? Did the, what you read from the cardiologist or the 
the transplant physician, did that uh, make you concerned? Do you want to talk about those things? Um, again, that's a way that palliative care can help share information um, about the patient's health across different specialties. You can really go the extra mile and start tracking patient successes and failures with shared notes um, that if you do that well, that may even be publishable, um, tracking who is actually accessing it, um, and then sharing best practices within your institution and outside your institution. And again, I'm gonna put out the call out there. There are no palliative care directly focused articles about open notes. Um, there are close ones and things that address that what we do, but there's not really a, a, a body of work and research or even quality improvement around this topic. So go at it, we have lots to learn. Uh, some things when you're thinking about how much you're using the chart, I just wanna highlight this if you don't know about this, uh, systems like Epic and Cerner have ways that you can actually look at how often your, uh, how much time your clinicians are spending on this. Not gonna go into details, but you can ask that from your uh, EHR support team. So let's get to the unique areas in palliative care. Prognostication, it's important. We need to think about it. We should probably document it but it's really changes how many of us may have used prognostication documentation before. We may have used it more to talk to our future selves or to talk to other clinicians to kind of put our flag out to say, I am concerned this patient has weeks to months to live and how will that impact their care? Well, now that we're in an area where open notes are there and if you document that, but you haven't shared that or you share that in a euphemistic indirect way, that's gonna be quite a potential jarring shock to patients and it's not something that we would probably wanna do verbally and communicate it that clunky in a clunky way. So we need to think if we haven't said it to the patient, um, then we need to really think about should we document it? And conversely, if we're planning on documenting, we really think it's important enough to document, then shouldn't we really put that into the conversation in a obviously a permission-based way if the patient is open to talking about it? And again, we can use this as a way to advance care. So maybe the patient doesn't want to talk about prognosis. You try to open it in the conversation, try to address it in a couple of different ways. But then the patient said, I don't want to hear about this. Well, think about having a smart phrase and, uh, uh, that says, the patient prefers to avoid prognosis discussion. That's factual. But you can also add, I'm hopeful we can discuss in the future to better plan together. That's a really positive synergistic way to say, this is something we can do together and I'm open to talking about it and that may open doors further down the road. Now, just a quick highlight here. I use the word smart phrase. That's very common in Epic platforms, um, but basically I use that to say a way that the computer can easily type out a longer sentence using a shortcut uh, way. So different EHRs have different uh, uh, terminology for that. Advanced care planning. So first of all, you need to know different orgs are interpreting what they need to share slightly differently. Yes, it's a federal rule, but how your healthcare organization decides to what exactly to share may be different. So you may have advanced care planning notes. They may or may not share them. So figure that out first. Um, when you're documenting an advanced care planning note, it is important to consider reviewing that note at the end of the visit or maybe in the future. So let's say you have a good uh, uh, advanced care planning discussion say, hey, this was a great discussion. I'm going to write this in the chart. I really want you to take a look at it after I, after I close it. If you have any changes or adjustments to make, let me know, because this is really going to direct their care potentially in a time where the patient doesn't have a voice. Um, and so if you're able to uh, get their feedback and input, that's going to give you a lot more confidence as a clinician that what you documented really reflects how they feel. Um, I think a great example of this is we hear patients say all the time, like, they may say, I don't want to go to the ICU. Well, a lot of people don't want to go to the ICU, but people who say that may say, but I will go to the ICU. And people can interpret a statement, if you put it in their quote, say, I don't want to go to the ICU as uh, a limitation on what level of care they want. But they may just say they have no, that means they have no desire to, but they're perfectly willing to do that if that's what it needs to happen. So I think that's where it's important to get some feedback on how we document advanced care planning notes. Um, if you ab avoid parts of the discussion based on how you're reading the situation or the patient's uh, not wanting to go into that, definitely document the attempt because I think that could help, uh, again, advance that care further down the road. Um, and if you want to do QI or research, uh, that may be a great opportunity for us. 
A different area that we care about and EHRs are still figuring out is how caregivers and proxies access the information for the patient. Um, it's important to recognize that, that caregiver roles vary uh, across an illness. They may just be technical support or they may be representing that patient. And still we're in a digital technology era where our habits may be sharing passwords on pieces of paper or taking advantage of a customized proxy account that the EHR can allow you to set up. And even those proxy accounts, they may be proxy accounts that have full access, limited access, or customized access. So it's important for you to understand what your health record looks like from the patient and the caregiver point of view. If you don't know that, spend some time with your EHR teams and explore that. Um, if you're concerned about documenting sensitive information, ask the patient. Um, to, and I have some uh, quotes for in-visit language that you can use. Um, but if it is sensitive info, it, it's important to say you may that you, you want to document that information. And if they have uh, concerns about it, I think it's important to listen to them. It doesn't mean you have to follow exactly what they say if your requirements for documentation and the patient safety and professional obligations and ethics override that. But I think it's important to have that discussion and understand how the patient may or may not feel about your documentation. Um, if there is a safety concern, many EHRs have a way to mark the note as sensitive. Um, that may be a clinically excellent idea to the system and how this may look um, to, uh, to their reporting is that may be considered, that is likely to be considered information blocking and generally a negative if it gets too much. So it is okay to mark a note as sensitive and maybe not share it with the patient, but you should hopefully be able to uh, back up the reasons for that so that if your organization comes back to you and says, Dr. Sinclair, you're marking 95% of your notes sensitive, that's way outside the range for the rest of the clinicians. Can we talk about why that is and maybe we can address uh, some different ways to do that and really get that sensitive notes down to maybe 5% or 10%, um, that may be more reasonable. Um, so you may hear from your organization if you mark a lot of notes sensitive or not shared. Um, uh, <laughs> not gonna go into issues here, but definitely incarcerated persons and who makes decision for them and their access to healthcare information definitely has uh, its own particular issues. Children and adolescents can't leave out our pediatric colleagues who do great work in pediatric palliative care. Um, again, st start with what is your organization doing with these notes? They may be handling these very differently. And also what are your current capabilities to customize access to this? Um, we know from the research that sexual health and adolescents and other sensitive topics like substance abuse or genetic data is, is well documented from an ethics uh, standpoint, but it, there's not a lot of information, although there is some, about how that operates in the shared environment of open notes. And so we still need to really figure out what are our norms here, and we need to have discussions and figure out best practices pretty quickly. Um, because we're addressing that growing autonomy of adolescents, but also the parental uh, supervision of them, it is, it is very challenging. There is a pediatric toolkit at Open Notes that will give you a great head start, but if you're encountering problems here, guess what? Someone else probably is too. Figure out what that problem is, share that information, spread that knowledge quickly so we can figure out best practices uh, sooner. Our social workers, our psychologists, our psychiatrists also deal with very sensitive issues um, and behavioral health and confidentiality um, has a long history, well documented. Um, but again, in this new world of open notes, um, we're still making sure we figure out what the norms are and what the ethical standards are. And so we need a lot of discussion around that. Um, if you are talking about diagnosing somebody with a, a psychiatric uh, disorder, then you, I think it's important that you talk about what those possible diagnoses are before you document it. It's one thing to have a conversation and then go into your document and say, I think that patient may possibly have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and you never said those words in clinic, much like the prognosis statement. That could be very jarring to see for the first time in documentation. So I think this open notes era documentation may actually make us better in visit communicators to talk about these very sensitive issues uh, in a way that helps advance the patient's care. Um, also, this is the area where ICD-10 codes, it may not be in your narrative documentation, but it may impact what the 
what the patient sees and how they feel about um, their own uh, mental health. Uh, I like the, to use, in, when I'm talking about potential uh, depression, anxiety, I like to use probabilities and use words like probable, like it's possible that they have major depressive disorder. I'm not necessarily in that moment diagnosing them, maybe it's my first visit, but I want to put that on a differential there. Um, and so put out a wide range of things. And I may say in my visit, you know, all the things you shared with me today, it has me concerned that we may need to look at some, uh, some, some diagnoses that may help us better understand why you're feeling that way um, and talk about those a little bit more so that I feel a lot more comfortable documenting that. Um, I like to, in my notes to also say may need more formal assessment and that cues future me to say, do we need a referral to psychiatry or to work with psychology or social work to help get a wider, deeper uh, assessment. One of the benefits too, as I said before, this can be a place where we can show respect, destigmatize, and actually be a tool for change and help in, in the health and uh, behavioral health issues. Substance and opioid use disorders. Uh, this is a very tricky area. This, these are also co covered by confidentiality laws, but they have to do with, are you a federally assisted program or not? And this is really complex stuff. State laws too, about how you document this is even more complex. Um, before I even get into this talk, I, you know, how I document about this, I haven't really had a standard. And the more that I researched on this, the more that I think it's going to be important for us to have conversations about how do we do this well. Um, but again, it goes back to if you're thinking about putting this in the chart, that you discuss these possible diagnoses before you actually document them so that you are really sharing your professional assessment. Um, again, this is another area where I like to use the weighted words for different probabilities. Um, and lastly, uh, in, these, in these issues, really avoid becoming a detective in your notes. I've seen this in different people's notes where there's speculation about what they're doing with their medicines when there's no evidence that they're stating that the, the patient is um, distributing them to, to somebody else. So really uh, be careful with your notes about speculation of motives, intent, and things that you don't have knowledge about. Um, request for hasten death, uh, I think, it's important to understand what your state laws are for, for medical aid and dying, um, but we know that regardless of state laws that these requests can come to us. And so, uh, so it is important to document these uh, requests respectfully, humanely, factually. Um, and if you're figuring out why the patient is asking for this, um, make sure that you, this is a great place to use patient quotes of phrases for their values, their reasoning around this. Um, and again, avoiding speculation, um, you know, if, uh, a family member just said an offhand comment like uh, that you're trying to, to speculate why they said something about these medicines hastening someone's death. Um, this is an area where you, our speculation could, could really not characterize the situation very well. Other things that I, I know we do in palliative care notes is we may try to evaluate relationships. That if there's tension between a patient and caregiver, um, they share very intimate details with us and they share details that they may not share with each other, their frustrations and their uh, uh, worries about the other party. Um, and we know that patient caregivers trust us with that information. And so thinking about how we document in the note, if a caregiver shares some private feelings about the patient, but you're writing in the patient's note and the patient's gonna see that, that can be pretty much equivalent to you going into the patient and say, do you know what your caregiver just told me? Um, so we really need to think wisely about how we document that. And sometimes this may be a place where we need to think that note might be sensitive for particular reasons. And then in the future, instead of making all your notes sensitive from that point forward, you can refer people back to that sensitive note if you're needing to talk with other clinicians. And again, this is an area we can use the note as a tool for benefit to highlight the strengths. We also may talk about how patients coping, if it's destructive or constructive coping, and so I think it's important, especially for negative coping mechanisms that we find language that captures what's happening and work with your team to find what's the best wording and aim for being factual, neutral, and professional and match the language that you use in your visit. And this is a really important point. The language we use in our visit and what we document may not be the same. They're the same in our head, but they may not be what we said to the patient. And I think open notes is an era that we're going to have to start thinking I have to document a lot closer to what I said, as opposed to the three conversations I was having in my head and thinking through it. 
because once we start documenting, all those conversations kind of come together and it feels like we might've said that to the patient, but we were only thinking about that or maybe we thought about it and debriefed and talked about it and debriefing with the team, but we never really said that to the patient or the caregiver. So try and use similar language in your documentation that matches what the patient and caregiver heard as opposed to what you thought or what you and your team discussed. So we also use notes for, for teaching to talking to our future self and making plans, handing off to colleagues, hopefully not fighting or arguing with other teams. But I think we might be asking a little bit too much of notes to do this. And we might need to really think, are there better ways to do that? So um, I think that's something that we can probably take off the burden of what we do in our notes and use other resources and, and channels to do that. So a couple of things, we're wrapping up here. So I want you to get your questions ready. Um, you can type them in the chat um, and, I, and we're gonna do some Q&A. So we're getting close to the end, but here's some in-visit language for sensitive issues that I have basically worked on over the past year. But if you're covering something sensitive and it's positive, I appreciate what you shared today. Thanks for trusting our team. I want to make sure my note summarizes what we discussed. So if you read it and have feedback, please let me know. Or maybe it's more of a negative sensitive issue and the, there's a little bit more attention. We covered some difficult topics today. I'm going to summar and summarize it in my note as best as I can. We may have different thoughts on this. And if you see areas we disagree on, please reach out to us. So it is OK to address that there might be conflict or tension. Um, but you're still a partner and wanting to help that patient and showing respect that you care what how they might see that. So as we wrap up and you guys are getting your questions, I want to acknowledge a few things. This is a change you may not have wanted. This is a change that may feel very sudden. This is a change which can bring anxiety. And if you think about that, that's a lot about what our patients are feeling too. It's probably a lot of what we're feeling with COVID as well. But you have more information. Now you can make a plan and now you can work with your team. So we can ride this wave and we can all improve our quality of life and our patients and caregivers quality of life too. So you are, are, are well suited to do that now. So to end, communication is a prerequisite and our notes are a tool for communication. And this is going to help us deliver quality care for the seriously ill. Here are some action items. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit. My email is down there. Um, I have talked to other institutions, so I am open to working with your team if you want to do that. I'm also on Twitter. Follow Liz Salmi, follow, follow Open Notes, follow Dr. DeRoche on Twitter. Um, there, you'll learn a lot from them. So with that, I am going to stop presenting and I'm going to give it over to you, Liz.